The topic of today's webinar takes us to um, other serious infectious diseases beyond COVID, which has taken up much of our collective attention in healthcare, discovery, vi virology, the media, and in our daily, everyday lives. But we need to recall the millions of afflicted with uh, globally by many other infectious diseases. So we'll attempt to uh, bridge that gap in the, in the end next hour. I'm Frank Cole with Here we go. I'm Frank Cole with CDD. Welcome. So today we're joined by two key University of Washington researchers. We have a Dr. Fred Buckner is professor at the University of Washington in the Department of Medicine, working in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and also an attending physician. Dr. Buckner's research concentrates on drug discovery for diseases caused by pathogenic protozoa. Dr. Michael Gelb is a biochemist and chemist specializing in enzymes and particularly those of medical significance. He is the Boris and Barbara Weinstein Endowed Chair in Chemistry at the University of Washington in Seattle. We're happy to have both Fred and Mike here with us today to spotlight the infectious disease work they're both working on as key scientists. So before we go too far, I will invite all of you in attendance to please type your questions along the way in the Q&A tab, not in the chat uh, so much, but in the Q&A tab so we can record them um, for later in the, in the broadcast. So. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Let's begin. Uh, I thought I'd start by asking you um, some general questions, a history of your work at UW, um, projects uh, outlining your research, uh, how you came about uh, to, to work together globally and uh, you know, together in your field. Thank you uh, for having us, uh, Frank. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Uh, if you don't mind showing the, the slide with the uh, UW organization, that would help. Thank you. There you go. Uh, so yes, uh, Mike and I are both uh, situated here in Seattle at the University of Washington, a, a lovely campus. I hope uh, people have the opportunity to visit someday. I'm in the Department of Medicine. You can see Mike's in the separate department, Department of Chemistry. We're actually on different campuses. Uh, I'm in the South Lake Union campus downtown, which is about four or five miles away from the main campus. Um, but Mike and I have been uh, working together for over 20 years now. Uh, I think it's been a very uh, productive and, and uh, successful collaboration. We have a group that we call the Anti-Parasitic Drug Discovery Group and uh, have had other uh, collaborators over the time. But I think by being in the same university, we have some benefits in terms of sharing you know, grant contract services, and we're able to have in-person meetings with each other, at least when it's not COVID times. Um, and uh, it's easy to um, share reagents. Uh, we're getting compounds from them and we're sending samples back uh, back and forth. So um, that's, uh, that's how we're sort of organized. And I'll let Mike uh, explain the history in terms of how we got started. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's nice to be here. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I joined University of Washington Chemistry Department, Biochemistry Department, their separate departments in 1985. So I've been here a while. I'm a veteran. Um, I was working uh, in enzymes uh, of medical importance involved in uh, production of lipid mediators of inflammation. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about parasites or anything. Um, Wim, Wim Hall was a uh, well-established uh, chris, protein crystallographer in Holland, and he was recruited to the biochemistry department um, in, in the early 90s, I think. And um, he was working on uh, structure-based drug design for trypanosome parasites, for example, the parasite that causes African sleeping sickness. And he was looking for chemists at the University of Washington that wanted to collaborate. And I was drawn into this. I became interested. I, 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 I was kind of medically slanted. You know, I was going to go to medical school, but I like chemistry more. So I, I ended up being a chemist that interested in medical importance. So, so he drew me into this thing. He was looking for chemists to collaborate. So we started to work on uh, inhibitors of parasite glycolytic enzymes, a project he started with Fred Oberdos and colleagues in Europe. And then uh, we, we came across uh, Fred Buckner and his colleague, Wes Van Voris in the Department of Medicine and Infectious Disease. And, you know, they, they, they were working on these parasites. They, they grow the parasites, they're molecular biologists that can handle 
manipulations of the genome in these parasites. And so we, we started to work together in the early 90s. Um, I, I, again, I was drawn into this. I was not in the field. I became very energetic about this. It seemed like we were going to um, work on something very, very important in terms of global health. And Wim Hole and I started a Keystone meeting in parasite drug discovery. So we had a lot of energy back then and um, went into it full speed ahead. Yeah, since the early 90s. Yeah. That's what I want to say. Thanks. Very good. All right. So um, a lot of focus in the past year or so has been on the lab, right? The pandemic, changing work habits. Um, and from the impact perspective, um, you know, yes, we don't want to talk too much about the pandemic, but I think it's interesting to, to explore that. So how's the pandemic issues changed the way um, the, the labs have been functioning and, and the, the collaborative research, research has been going on? Uh, what's different? What's, what's actually gone on in your individual uh, work and you know, collaboration in terms of that change, any changes? Um, sure, I can start with that one. I mean, uh, it's it's obviously had an impact. We were all closed down here for a few months uh, in uh, March, April, May, uh, at least in my department. It, it was handled at the university a little differently in the different departments. Uh, but um, uh, we, we were quite limited in terms of what we were able to actually do in the lab. They opened us up in the Department of Medicine, particularly infectious diseases, I think a little bit earlier than maybe other departments because of you know, the perceived importance of, of the work as, as it pertains to COVID and other infections. So, so there, there was that aspect of, of, of things. Uh, we've, we've continued to work uh, in shifts with social distancing, things of that nature uh, to this day. Uh, I think the plan uh, at the university is still developing. My understanding in the fall, uh, students will all be expected to be vaccinated and they're planning to have in-person classes. But, you know, everything has changed. We're doing, we're doing all our meetings like everybody else by Zoom and, and uh, uh, lots, of, uh, lots more of the work is being done remotely and such. Uh, Mike, how about you? <clears throat> Yeah, it's, it's what Fred said. I think the medical school opened up first. Um, and then like in the chemistry department, um, we were told to, pre to prepare a COVID laboratory safety plan, but we, we pretty much just copied the templates coming from the medical school since they went first. Every lab had their own safety plan, but but they're, they're, they were pretty much similar. They were all templated after each other. So then we started to go go into lab in, in shifts with social distancing and mask wearing. Uh, all of the chemistry faculty for the most part are at home. We're teaching remotely uh, and we're running our labs with Zoom meetings. Uh, my, my lab is going at about 60 or 70% of full speed uh, because we, we go in shifts. Um, so, so really it's not too different right now. The last nine months we've been wor working almost full full speed ahead. Um, so let's say 70% because of the shifts, but you know, the lab students and postdocs and everything are um, working like normal and you know, they wear masks and they, wipe doorknobs and keep six feet apart. And, and uh, so I, the faculty have been at home. Uh, it, uh, it's not clear what happens. You know, there's some talk that, are we ever going back full-time in our offices? The university is starting to ask us, are we gonna be in our office full-time in the fall? And I, I think most people say kind of yes, hybrid, probably not, yeah, we might, might not go in uh, 10 hours a day, every day of the week anymore, but you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with, with uh, things that can be done at home. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody is asking this question, right? Whether you work for Google or whatever, uh, are you gonna be in, in your office in a building all, all the time in the future? And I think nobody knows, you know? So um, I might add in terms of just the impact of COVID, it's been pretty profound in terms of my department and division, particularly infectious diseases. I've seen a lot of colleagues who, who've, um, you know, really shifted their research focus over to COVID. And that's obviously a good opportunity for a lot of people. Um, I've sort of avoided the temptation. I mean, uh, I, I'm a parasitologist. Uh, 
I'm, I have grants to work in parasitology and, and as much as uh, there are new opportunities available, I didn't really consider myself to be the best situated person to shift gears and become a virologist and, and this and that. Uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, and you know, it's, it's not like COVID has made other problems go away, right? We still have all the same diseases we used to have and, and uh, the ongoing need to work on those. So I don't know, uh, you know, there, there's certainly been opportunities uh, that have been, that have, that have come our way, tons and tons of funding and interest and whatnot. But, uh, um, you know, I think, I think the researchers kind of have to make an individual decision about how much they want to derail their previous um, career interests uh, and shift over to COVID or just uh, stick with what they're doing or somehow make, combine them. Uh, very good. Um, yeah, interesting. The, the next thing, the next thought here was about the, 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 the positivity. I mean, all the work that's been going on towards the COVID problem, right? How's it, how's it affected thoughts in uh, drug discovery? You know, you know, you know, what's the effect? positive effect, negative effect of, uh, of all this effort, you know, with the general public and with the, um, you know, you know PPP and, and what have you. So curious about what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, the negatives are pretty obvious. I mean, you know, the, the, the closure of the labs, the cancellation of, of meetings, uh, certainly. Um, and I, I think in terms of big programs around the world uh, that are working on control of infectious diseases like TB and malaria. There have been uh, major setbacks. I have colleagues who say that some of these programs are maybe set back by five or 10 years in terms of the progress that's been, that been made to this point. So uh, obviously COVID has been a devastating problem and the negatives overwhelm the positives. But um, I, I do think in terms of looking at the positive aspects, I think uh, COVID is certainly shed a light on the importance of infectious diseases and nobody, nobody can ignore this topic. Uh, so certainly um, has, has brought a lot of attention to infectious diseases. I think that's gonna bring more funding uh, both to, to basic science and to things like you know, pandemic preparedness. Um, I'd like to also think, I don't know that this is true, but I'd like to think that people will recognize that for example, the, the amazing response in terms of producing a vaccine quickly, that didn't just come out of, out of the blue, that came out of decades of, of basic science research that's been going on uh, that led to this point where literally the minute we knew what the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was, people were uh, producing a vaccine and, and in, in uh, formats that, that um, you know, we're gonna generate a good immune response and a good vaccine. You can say the same thing about remdesivir, the antiviral drug that Gilead made, that, that didn't just drop out of the blue, that, that had been an antiviral drug that was in the pipeline and, uh, and, and was fairly quickly identified as one with promise against COVID and is being used, uh, you know, quite widely in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So. Uh, so hopefully uh, the recognition that, that basic and applied medical research is important will, will uh, be imprinted on people and, and will lead to uh, you know, support uh, for, for this sort of thing. Mike, anything to add or shall we? No, I think we should, uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's fine, yeah. Good. Uh, before we go to the next question, uh, this is this is an interesting, interesting graphic that you shared with me. If the machine will do what it's told to do, there we go. Uh, a little bit on your on your collaboration again. This is something that you started to talk about earlier, but it kind of gives you, you know, the various groups that are working together. This might be worth um, sharing some information on with the public. Yeah, yeah Mike, this goes to what you were explaining. I, if you want to, you could maybe just describe a little bit about some of the targets that we've worked on and. Yeah, it's 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 um take, taking advantage of opportunities that came up. So as I said, when Wim Hall came here from Europe, he brought with him the um the the, the glycolytic enzyme targets, uh, trypanosomes, uh, like 
T. brucei that causes sleeping sickness uh, relies on um, glycolysis as its sole set source of energy when it's growing in your blood. And so the, the gly it has a special organelle called the glycosome where, the, where glycolysis is taking place. It, it doesn't have oxidative phosphorylation in the bloodstream form. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it's, it's growing on glucose. Um, my lab, along with John Glompset, uh, he passed away uh, five years ago in the biochemical department. We, 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 we discovered uh, something called pink farnesyl transfer, farnesyl transfer, protein isoprenylation. It's uh, a new lipid anchor that's attached to proteins in eukaryotic cells. Um, the protein farnesyl transferase uh, became a really hot target for cancer because the RAS onco oncogene, oncoprotein, uh, which is driving many cancers, uh, requires farnesylation for its membrane anchoring. And, and so uh, pretty much every major drug company started to work on protein farnesyl transferase inhibitors for cancer. So we had, my lab, having discovered this, we, we sort of said, well, what about this in parasites? So we we're working on parasites. And we had the idea, so, so parasites became very, are very sensitive to these inhibitors. And we had the idea that we could take advantage of all of this rich medicinal chemistry and even clinical results on protein farnesyl transfers in, in humans. And so we piggybacked, um, we piggybacked uh, malaria drug discovery uh, off of that. And, and we had a very successful program until we, we hit a dead end. Um, um, that, it turns out one of the protein farnesyl transferase inhibitors uh, was a really potent inhibitor of uh, sterol biosynthetic enzyme in T. cruzi. T. cruzi causes Chagas disease and they, they need to make ergosterol instead of cholesterol. And there's a cytochrome P450 that um, is taken out by a protein farnesyl transferase inhibitor. It's just, we ended up in this field, uh, a, a, an off target effect that, that um, and then that we worked on that for a while until it was proven in the clinic with other sterile biosynthetic enzyme inhibitors that, um, that this is not a great target for T. cruzi, that it only arrests the growth of the parasite, but doesn't kill the parasite. Um, um, and then maybe Fred can talk about the RNA synthesis. Um, and and, and I, I just, I'll just say that um, about 10 years ago, we, we embarked on a project, uh, a, a phenotypic screen involving workers at the Genome Institute of Novartis Foundation down in Hoya. Um, I knew the director at the time, uh, Peter Schultz, uh, very well, and he, uh, they were running uh, basically testing libraries of compounds to see if any of them would <clears throat> block the growth of these parasites. And so we were then linked with them to, to use these hits that came out of this library screen for T. brucei for the sleeping sickness parasite. And we, we this project we're still working on today. It's a very successful project. So that's a phenotypic screen where we don't know the target uh, back then. We're starting to get some information about what the target is now. Uh, and then Fred started the tRNA synthetase and protein kinase projects. Maybe he can talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll mainly mention the tRNA synthetases. We, so Mike has referred to Wim Hull's group a couple of times. Uh, also, uh, other members in the biochemistry department here, Dr. Rakeem Fan and Christopher Linda. So we had a uh, program called the uh, Structural Genomics of Pathogenic Protozoa that Wim was a PI of, started maybe about 15 years ago. And that was one of these uh, NIH supported structural genomic programs. Our focus was on pathogenic protozoa. I think the intent was to work on these unusual organisms with the idea that they had uh, unusual proteins that might have unusual folds and, and uh, sort of a basic science approach. We, we were always interested, of course, in the medical as applications of this and uh, taking uh, these targets and, and thinking about them in terms of their potential as drug targets. Um, and uh, of the, you know, literally thousands of possible proteins, uh, tRNA synthetases uh, became an area that, that uh, was an interest of ours. We had quite a bit of success producing and making crystal structures of these proteins. 
So that was an aspect and, and that, uh, you know, supported a program of, of structure-based drug design and such. Uh, my group with uh, Dr. Fan's group is really uh, further focused on the methionyl tRNA synthetases. Um, this is the enzyme that charges uh, tRNA with methionine, which is essential obviously for protein synthesis. And um, this is an enzyme that um, is obviously found throughout all organisms or, or um, uh, but is, uh, that has some distinctive features in parasites, particularly in the trypanosomes and leishmania that we work on that uh, where there are exploitable differences in the enzyme uh, that, that has uh, allowed us to identify selective inhibitors. Uh, we're working on this uh, in a uh, project uh, related to um, trypan trypanosomes, particularly the one that causes uh, Chagas disease, as well as the one that causes African sleeping sickness. Uh, we've uh, worked on uh, this uh, in the area of cryptosporidium, which is an uh, intestinal parasite uh, somewhat related to malaria. Uh, and we've also actually uh, uh, gotten into the space of antibiotic drug discovery uh, as well uh, with with these uh, with this target. So um, that all sort of sprung out of work with um, that really started in a basic science type of approach and then is being translated into uh, what we're hoping will be uh, therapeutics. Good. Thanks for that. So Fred, I had a question for you on uh, thinking about the clinic, right? So. Uh, as as someone who is working, you know, in in uh, as an MD as well, so uh, maybe you can share a little bit about the clinic versus the preclinical pre research. How does one inform the other? You have some highlights on that. Sure, I think there was a slide about about uh, the diseases. Uh, that might be a good time to look onto that. Yeah, there we go. Right, so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a, uh, an MD, I'm an infectious disease specialist, but I spend most of my time running a lab, but I uh, continue to work in a, in a uh, clinic one day a week at, at UW Medical Center. It's the uh, Tropical Disease, Infectious Disease Clinic. Um, we uh, uh, see a mix of uh, patients there, but uh, we're always interested in patients with uh, tropical uh, diseases. Um, my um, research is really focused on these um, neglected tropical diseases and in particular, uh, these trypanosomes. Um, and I'll just mention a little bit about these diseases because I think they're incredibly interesting and, uh, and uh, many people don't know much about them because they uh, primarily occur outside of the United States. But African sleeping sickness, as the name implies, is is, occurs in Africa, it's transmitted by the tsetse fly. And uh, that parasite you can see above uh, the a woman who's in a coma there is, uh, and that's why it's called sleeping sickness. The parasite enters uh, initially in the skin and spreads uh, uh, through the uh, blood, eventually getting into the brain where it induces a coma and uh, hence uh, the name sleeping sickness. And this is a fatal disease if it's not uh, identified and, and treated. Uh, Chagas disease is the one in the middle there. This is also transmitted by a trypanosome, trypanosoma cusi. Uh, the boy there uh, has been infected through the mucous membranes on his eye. He's got a conjunctivitis, but that parasite gets into the system, disseminates throughout, and eventually uh, will um, find its way to muscle, including heart muscle, where it damages it. This is a disease that manifests over years and years and, and uh, uh, will eventually lead to congestive heart failure or arrhythmias that can be fatal. And so this is a very serious disease. Chagas disease is, uh, occurs mainly in, the, uh, in South and Central America. There's also um, some uh, spots in Southern United States as well. And then Leishmaniasis is another one of these organisms in the trypanosomatid group. Uh, and that's transmitted by sand flies. Uh, you can see a person who has these sort of uh, nasty looking lesions on the skin uh, that can um, uh, simmer for months and months uh, spreading and, and be very disfiguring. 
there's a form of this where it can spread to the organs, particularly the liver and the bone marrow. Uh, that's called a visceral leishmaniasis, and that's fatal when that occurs. Um, and then uh, malaria is another area that we've worked on, uh, and that probably doesn't need much explanation. I think people are familiar with malaria. And cryptosporidiosis is a another apical complexin parasite somewhat related to malaria, but it causes diarrheal disease, particularly a devastating disease in, in children. Uh, it adds to problems with malnutrition and, and stunts growth and, and uh, cognitive development um, and is also a big problem in uh, immune compromised people, uh, particularly uh, people living with HIV. So you were asking how my, um, you know, clinical experience lends itself to the research. I, I guess I would say that, you know, it's important to understand the diseases that you're working on. Uh, you know, these are very different in terms of what parts of the body are affected, the, the time course of how these diseases manifest, uh, the age groups that are affected, uh, what the needs are in terms of treatment. I mean, for example, African sleeping sickness, when it enters a CNS, that's 100% fatal disease. We have very poor drugs for treating that right now. And what, you know, we'll take anything basically, obviously not something that's unsafe, but we need better drugs desperately for diseases that's 100% fatal. Chagas disease is a different story because we're often trying to identify people before they're even symptomatic. And if you're going to be providing prophylactic treatment to someone who's otherwise healthy, who may or may not develop disease manifestations, then you have a very different threshold for finding drugs that are absolutely safe, particularly if you're giving them to children or young women of childbearing potential and things like that. So you have to think about those kind of things. And I think by being a clinician that helps, helps um, you know, me understand that. Um, I also, you know, have an appreciation for the shortcomings of the drugs that are available. These neglected diseases um, tend to have drugs that were developed decades ago that probably would never have been developed in modern, modern day uh, in terms of uh, getting through screening programs. Uh, many of them are toxic and uh, don't even work that well. And so uh, there's a real, a real need, uh, real need for, uh, for improving, improving uh, upon the existing drugs. Right, that, that kind of leads to my next question is about screening, you know, partnering screening, you know, what kinds of types of screening you do and who you're working with kind of thing. So I think you have a slide that also talks a little bit about that as well. This one. Sure. Yeah, so uh, Mike, you can elaborate, but I, I just kind of put this up here to, to help uh, people see uh, uh, how, we, how we think about this. As far as on the right there, the drug discovery strategies, um, we've, we're, we're not purists about how we go about this. Um, our goal is to make drugs and, and uh, we'll do it you know, by hook or by crook. Uh, there's phenotypic drug screens. Mike was alluding to that. We, uh, in, in that sense, one of course is, is screening compound libraries against whole organisms and finding hits and then working with those hits to make them leads and, and beyond. Uh, often and typically you don't know the target, the biochemical target when taking that approach. Uh, the other approach is what I mentioned before in terms of where we start with a defined target and uh, uh, such as we were doing with the tRNA synthetase, synthetases and then uh, trying to design compounds. The, the latter um, is, is obviously intellectually very satisfying and, and exciting, uh, but I'm not sure that uh, the jury is out in terms of which of these approaches truly works better to deliver a drug at the end of the day. I think, uh, uh, Mike, you probably have opinions about that, and I'd love to hear you. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, agree, I agree with Fred. I, I mean, I don't think you should, you know, we tend to choose sides here, you know, the uh, structure-based people take on the phenotypic screen people. I mean, 
I mean, first of all, for parasite diseases, you can do phenotypic screens. You know, you can't do this for Alzheimer disease drugs. We have no way to screen. Um, you know, you, you can grow parasites in high throughput and you can put millions of compounds into the, into the assay wells and, and there's high throughput fluorescent methods for measuring parasite growth. So phenotypic screens for antimicrobial agents is rel relatively trivial to do these days. Uh, it's no harder than screening uh, a library of compounds as an enzyme inhibitor, for example, if you have an enzyme assay. What's interesting is we thought, you know, we would screen all these libraries from Pfizer and Merck and all of it, and we'd have all these rich compounds uh, to build drug discovery programs. Um, to some extent, that's true, but to some extent, it hasn't been overwhelming. Uh, for example, the, the compound that Fred and I are working on that's, I would say, the most promising preclinical candidate for Chagas disease in the world today Um we're not the only lab to land on this compound. So it has come out of uh, two other screens uh, done by other labs. And to some extent, uh, we're competing with them, although we welcome competition because we want, we want a drug. We really don't care who gets there first. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like to, but you know, I'd, 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 I'd be happy to shake the hand of somebody who can develop a drug for Chagas disease, even if it's not us. But it, it shows that that there's not a, a large number of new targets coming out of these phenotypic screens. Um, it's not that rich. And, and pretty soon, uh, you know, all the hits that have come out of Pfizer and things like that, pretty soon within five years, I would think, we're, we're, medicinal chemists are, are going to exhaust the exploration of these early hits uh, to develop as, as drugs. So it's not, there's not, there's not like 20 years of hits out there uh, from these screens. We're gonna run out pretty soon. So we're, so we're gonna need to keep going with non-phenotypic screens. And so there's, there's a place for you know, rational drug discovery uh, based on targets. Um, if you look at, I, I think the best way to answer this question, like who's winning or, you know, I don't, I don't really care, but, but if you look at the Medicines for Malaria Venture Pipeline, um, this is, you know, the largest anti-malarial drug discovery campaign in the world. Uh, it's, you know, it, you should look at the MMV website. They, they, they've been very successful. Um, you know, if you look at the pipeline, you'll see, uh, you'll see a mixture of, of drug development based on phenotypic screens, as well as rational structure-based design. Um, I, I, there's probably a slight larger number of phenotypic screen programs, but it's not overwhelming. It's pretty balanced. So, so in terms of what people are actually doing in the real world, having success, uh, I think it's, it's both. Uh, you cannot argue that one is, one is dominating the other. Uh, and, and, and so, so two points is the data shows that both programs are still viable and, and useful. And the other point is that uh, the phenotypic screens of large libraries have not generated an unlimited number of um, early leads that we can develop into drugs. We're gonna exhaust those hits pretty soon. Uh, there's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's surprising, right? Um, it's so, interesting how common, how many of these screens lead to the same targets, even with different chemical matter. So, so there, there's- been I mean, in terms of and I desires to work on phenotypic screens or structure based. I mean, we don't really care whatever, whatever is working. Um, we've done both and we will, we, we have a pretty high bar. Uh, we're interested in, in compounds that kill the parasite and we have to prove early on that they kill. We, we have a number of compounds that are cytostatic for the parasites that just arrest their growth, but you take the drug away and the parasites come back. So that's not gonna be useful because you have to take drug your whole life. We wanna cure these diseases. We wanna kill them. We don't wanna just have a cytostatic drug. And in fact, that's what happened with the sterol inhibitors for Chagas disease is that they worked really well in animals, but they don't cure the disease because the parasites um, just kind of go into dormancy. Uh, they don't get killed. So you take the drug away and it comes back. So, so we, we, we have these, criteria are gone that we've learned from experience that the compound has to meet before we take interest, right? It has to, it has to be cytotoxic, not cytostatic. 
Um, in the case of T. Bruce, yeah, it has to get in, into the CNS. It has to get into the brain because the you, you have to follow the target uh, drug profile where, um, you know, the drug, we, 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 African sleepy sickness, the serious form of the disease is, is, a, is a central nervous disease. Uh, we have to kill the parasite in the brain. So we, we have that as a, as a criteria early on. Uh, so from these phenotypic screens, we throw away all the compounds that don't get into mice brain when injected into the blood. Uh, we throw these away uh, early on. Uh, and we, we don't try to rescue compounds to try to get them into the brain. That seems pretty hard. We go with the ones that already get into the brain. Um, yeah, so, so we, we, we happen to be working on a phenotypic screen program right now just because we're far along and it's where, it's where we're at. We, we've done both and we don't have preferences. We, we have open minds, but I think both are required. Well, you know, that, that leads to a poll question we, we've actually prepped for the audience to participate in it that kind of follows up with everything you just said, guys. So, uh, Charlie, why don't you go ahead and uh, post that uh, polling question? All right, everyone. Hello. I'm going to launch a poll for the attendees um, to respond to here. What strategy do you favor for our identifying hit compounds in early drug discovery? Uh, so phenotypic tar target-based screening, in silico screening, or the wonderful bucket of other. So we'll let the attendees have a moment to uh, respond. They're off to the races. I'm sure you can uh, use your crystal balls and predict which ones are first and second so far. So uh, one thing I'll add on top of this is that, um, you know, uh, with, with target-based screening, it's, you know, you, it's easy to really fall in love with your target and become kind of wedded to that and, and, and committed to that. And that is obviously good, but it's also not necessarily a good thing for drug discovery because if if the target is flawed for some reason for for as a drug target it's hard to it's hard to move on right with phenotypic screening you know mike was mentioning how we started with the screen at gnf and we had about 20 starting compounds that uh, uh were different you know significantly different scaffolds and it was pretty easy to move on from one to the next uh, because you really, you know, I mean, I mean, you you break the heart of the chemist who's been working on a target, but it's or, or on a chemical scaffold, but it's not the same thing as um, as having your career dedicated to say working on protein kinases and then finding out that the kinase that this kinase isn't really a good drug target or something. So uh, there's that sort of psychological aspect of of things. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so the results here from the attendees anyway show 41% uh, favoring phenotypic screening over 34% of target-based, and you can see the results. Uh, any thoughts on how that fits into uh, your perspective? Are you surprised? Slightly, but I, 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 uh, I'm glad to see that there's, there's a mix there. It seems like there's, there's room for everybody in this, in this thing. I, I think if you had asked this people 10 years ago, you would have seen target-based screening as a much more popular approach. And I think what we've learned is that there's a, still a lot of good that comes out of phenotypic screening. And, and uh, while we're still you know, in a time where, sure, we have the genomes for all these organisms, but we still don't know what you know, a large fraction of these proteins are doing. And uh, we need to be open-minded that they're a good good targets in there uh, that categorize as, as function undefined. Um, and and uh, we can't just work on things that have a good name and we know, you know, we know uh, mostly what they do. We should be uh, open to finding new, new, uh, new targets. So I think phenotypic is an advantage that way. Excellent, all right, Frank, back to you. Yeah, super. Um, just want to remind folks uh, uh, in the attendee panel, if they have questions for our panelists, please uh, type them into the Q&A panel. We'll get them as soon as we're finished with the rest of our questions. So that would be, uh, that'd be fantastic. So a uh, question for Mike. Uh, so looking back, uh, uh, can you share a bit on both your basic and applied research? Um, you know, a little bit about your, your a little bit more history. You know, you're, you're, I mean, this is kind of personal, but maybe, yeah. maybe 
it, it's similar to many academic stories. I mean, we all start out, many of us start out in, in less, uh, what's it called? Um, translational research. Uh, we, we, we work in fundamental research. Certainly that's what I did. I worked on phospholipase A2 for 30 years. I was one of the top scientists in the field studying the identity of these enzymes involved in generation of arachidonic acid to make uh, the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes that are obviously involved in inflammation. It, it was a good time to be in the field. Um, uh, I, I, I was at the top of this field. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I, I wanted to go to medical school and, and uh, to some extent, but I like chemistry more. So I, I always had an interest in, in doing something for, you know, directly related to medicine. Uh, so that, you know, when Wim Hull came here, uh, the, the thought of making a drug for malaria really excited me. Um, and it, it became a significant part of what I did. And so we were doing both. Um, and, you know, and, and Fred and Wes Van Voris and all of us, we were a team and it, it was good. We had, um, it is good. We, we, you know, people, um, I think the key is, uh, there was a question about collaboration. I think the key is um, you have to trust the other lab. You, the other lab has to be uh, equivalently talented. Otherwise, you, you start rolling your eyes to the other lab and you, what am I doing talking to these guys? So, so. You know, Fred's a smart guy, and so he fits in with what I like. Um, and so I, you have, and everybody has to have certain aspects of the project that they're good at. I mean, we don't grow parasites. Fred, Fred's not a chemist. So, I mean, we, we, the, the collaboration is needed. It has to be needed. You have to think highly of the other side, and you, 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 you um, have to trust each other. But you do not have to be at the same institution. I mean, I have collaborations all over the world. They work fine with, with internet. Um, doesn't have to be at the same institution. But then uh, what happened, uh, just, I, I, my wife was pregnant. She had, um, when she was 40, she had amniocentesis. Uh, it was recommended. And uh, I asked the nurse, like, what do you test for? And it was a couple of diseases. And, and being an enzymologist, I started to become interested in um, testing enzymes, enzyme deficiency diseases because of this experience with my wife. And I started to think a new project where we would use mass spectrometry to, to test as many enzymes as possible. And I sat on this for a few years and I finally met with uh, Ron Scott at Children's Hospital here. And he said, yeah, there could be real good use for this kind of mass spectrometry technology. And within five years, we became the top lab in the world, I would say in um, developing new assays for newborn screening of uh, treatable genetic diseases. And, and this has really taken off <laughs> to the point, you know, we've had, F we have an FDA approved newborn screening test. We were, we're uh, every parent of every genetic disease uh, comes to us for help. And, and so we're really involved uh, in, in trying to test for these diseases, um, you know, talking to families that have uh, kids with genetic diseases. So it's a, it's a, it's a really good feel good project. Um, and it sort of has taken over what we do. And it's the major project in my lab. Now it's about my lab's about 40% parasitology and about 60% newborn screening. I, I have to say that, you know, the tent translational aspect of it, where you're going to meetings, talking to families that suffer because they have an affected child and becoming sort of a, a hero in their eyes. I, I mean, it, it, is, it is very rewarding. But I, it's not something that, I, that you have to do. Um, it's something that I wanted to do later on in my career uh, as time is running out. I, I wanted to get something in the real world um, and not um, only work on fundamental research. But I, I think it's a personal choice. I think they're both important and nobody knows how much money we should spend on translational research versus fundamental research. I think we need both, right? And, and we, we should just let the NIH figure that out and we should just let it be split approximately equally between the two. Uh, I, I think nobody has a better answer. I certainly don't, but I, it's just a personal reason that I've moved more to translational research later on in my career, sort of sparked by this, this event in my life. Um, this amniocentesis got me thinking about a completely different field that I knew nothing about. <laughs>
Yeah. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Mike. It seems to be a lot of stories like that, where people are drawn into um, maybe even founding a company because of something personally they're going through. It's, uh, it's quite interesting stuff. I personally have family members who have, uh, who've had uh, an infant uh, diagnosed with Pitt Hopkins syndrome. That was something that they, they had no idea, but this, uh, the, the, the question became, you know, what do I do about this? There's no information and just like, okay, I have to immerse myself totally into this and, and just be on the forefront of uh, information sharing. So quite, quite an interesting story. I mean, and the other thing I would say is if you look in this field of newborn screening and genetic diseases in newborns, I mean, there was very few chemists and, and I, and so mostly MDs and clinicians and, so, so quickly, uh, it, it became a chemical problem. So that's why I rose very quickly to the top because uh, the chemical skills uh, take me to places that most people in the field can't even think about. You know, th these problems are relatively easy to solve if you're a chemist, but not if you're not a chemist. So, so it was easy for me. Yeah, I saw a niche. A niche. A niche was key. I got lucky with this niche, right? I, I, I just, it just, it just exploded. Yeah. yeah. For sure, very good. Uh, Time-wise, let's see how we're doing. The next next question I have is quite interesting. It's like, um, you know, thinking about how how one decides to pick a disease or target. You know, you know what 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 drives folks out there, and specifically to you guys. I know you have uh, thoughts on that. So, what makes you decide to choose a disease or a target to, to have research on? You know, when do you decide to do what you need to do? Yeah, well, Mike just spoke about niches, and you know these neglected tropical diseases, these protozoan pathogens, uh, you know, th this is just not an area that pharma is working in very aggressively. And uh, one can look at the drugs that are out there and recognize that, that these are not modern drugs for the most part. Uh, so there's a need there and, uh, uh, you know, ac academia is usually not the place where drug discovery and development is done, but uh, if it's not us, who's it going to be? And there is actually funding for uh, through the NIH for this kind of work. So, you know, I was able to find this niche of uh, tropical disease drug discovery research in academia. Um, so that's it's kind of there's a need, and and uh, uh, and the need is so much over, you know, so much greater than what we are able to actually. Uh, deliver, but uh, we're doing the best we can uh, with the resources that are available. You know, we're grateful to the organizations like the Gates Foundation that also recognize this problem that there's a huge gap uh, between uh, the impact of uh, tropical diseases and, and the resources that are going into both controlling them and finding vaccines and cures for them. So, uh, you know, that's what motivates me is, is uh, uh, you know, working on these important human diseases that affect millions and millions of people, but just don't get the um, don't get the attention that they deserve because they tend to occur in poorer countries, often afflicting uh, low people who are the poorest of the poor and and uh, don't have resources and and such. So there's not not much money to be made at the end of the day off of these diseases. I want to add to that. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, another another question that comes to mind is uh, uh, speaking for yourselves. How do you collaborate logistically, you know, together and with other industry partners? You mentioned GSK somewhere along the line as well. Uh, sure. Um, you know, I had that slide. I don't know if it made it in there of the of the sort of the uh, valley of death. Yes. Let me let me put it back up. Yes. Let me put it back up and. Uh, Get that, uh, get that going for you. Yeah, that. Um, there you go. I mean, your question is about collaboration, and 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 what Mike and I, uh, you know, collaborate as many uh, academic labs do with each other. Uh, I don't think that part is complicated, but what what is complicated is is kind of moving beyond academia. We're, you know, that's the hard part. Is is taking something that looks promising and being able to do the needed research to get it to the next level where it could actually go into clinical trials for humans. And the problem with, you know, the, the way that um, 
systems organize is it's, it's not easy to, get, it's expensive research doing that sort of preclinical development. And it's not easily funded through academic, you know, NIH and things like that because it doesn't make particularly interesting science. And so as this graph illustrates, there's this kind of idea of this valley of death where things that are developed in academia just kind of die before they are able to see the light of day uh, in terms of being translated. Um, and that's where the, these um, product development partnerships are playing a, an important role. Um, we've worked with both the MMV, excuse me, <coughs> MMV, which is the Medicines for Malaria Venture, uh, and for an organization called Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. These are both based in Geneva. Uh, and um, these uh, are trying to support exactly what we're talking about, helping to develop drugs for um, tropical and parasitic infectious diseases and uh, getting them from either academic labs or biotech labs, other sources and, and, and getting them across this valley of, of death. Um, years ago, we had a MMV project that Mike was co-PI on with Dr. Van Boris here at the UW on the Varnacil transferase inhibitors. And we've worked closely with DNDI and we are currently working closely with them on our uh, project developing a Chagas drug, they've uh, been able to link us up with uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, who has a research uh, campus in uh, Tres Cantos, Spain, that is uh, uh, working on tropical disease research. And um, uh, so uh, these sort of collaborations have been bridged by, uh, in large part, by these product development partnerships that we're grateful for. And, just to mention that the funding for a lot of these comes from organizations like, um, you know, Gates Foundation, uh, Welcome Trust, and, and such. So philanthropy is a big part of, of what of what allows that to happen. Right, right. Um, interesting, because uh, the, the the question is the next question that comes to mind is what's what's underserved and what recommendations would you have in terms of focus uh, for the future? Right. Um, of course, the idea of antimicrobial resistance comes up, you know, and you know, a, a great need there and other things such as maybe, you know, how do we prepare for the next pandemic is always the question that comes after, you know, what we've experienced in the past year. Right, right. Um, well, I'm, you know, I think infectious diseases in general is an area that, uh, particularly with the recent events with COVID-19 is getting a lot of attention, but it's also illustrating that, that uh, you know, we have a long way to go. I mean, years and years ago, they were sort of celebrating the end of infectious diseases with all our great antibiotics. And what we've learned is, is that infections are, are always going to be with us and, and, uh, and we need to be ready to deal with them proactively through vaccines and with things like uh, anticipating antibiotic resistance. I think one area that really hopefully will get attention is pandemic preparedness. Um, it's a, um, you know, uh, there was so much more that could have been done to have mitigated the damage with COVID-19 uh, if we had been better prepared uh, and jumped on it uh, quicker. That's complicated, obviously, but um, I certainly would-, would can, you give us, can you give us a sense of that's not obvious to me, but you've been thinking about this. You're an infectious. What could we have done differently? Uh, I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, well, I think there's uh, what, what, know, what, what, early, early warning systems are important, and those have been defunded, uh, unfortunately, during the yeah. last administration, so that there were early warning systems on the ground that were just under-resourced or just flat yeah, out. But what would we have done? You know, closed the borders, uh, you know, uh, sent everybody home. It's not clear uh, these things would work, whether they're doable. I mean, it's very complicated, so I don't, I don't know. And it depends on the disease, but recall the first SARS, uh, that thing got snuffed out before it got out of hand. And in large part because very aggressive case tracking and, and control. Now, there might have been features of that that made it less contagious and, and so it didn't escape. I'm not an expert on this, but yeah. 
That's what we. That's what we. That's what we hear. But I don't. I don't think we know the answer to these questions. But I. I thought SARS was less infectious, uh, contagious. Yeah, but you know, certainly MERS was. Uh, anyways, these are complicated questions. I, I. I'm not sure. We could talk about this for hours. I'm yeah, sure. they uh, really are complicated, and I know we don't have a lot of time. So yeah. I, I know you guys sent me this amazing slide of people that we know, of course, and people that you've you've worked with. Um, so this is this is great academic leaders. Um, yeah, this I think this slide is just just a quick mm -hmm. off the cuff list of people that we know have a major presence in discovery for these uh, for these trypanosomes and malaria. You know, we're not talking about there's there's tuberculosis and things like that, which mm -hmm. Ebola. Um, it it kind of shows you that the list is not huge. Um, th this is most of the key players in the field. Uh, we probably left out a few, but you know, it's not. It's not, it's, it's probably less than a hundred labs worldwide. If I had to guess a number, right? It's not huge. Um, um, yeah. And, 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 and uh, it's gotten a lot bigger, you know, when Wim Hole came here and I got, I mean, we, there were like five labs working in this. And, and I think what happened was, uh, you know, Gates put a lot of money into this and my, you know, it's driven by money, right? Um, and 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 it, everybody's it got it got bigger uh, because of money. Uh, you know, uh, NIH a little bit, but but uh, I think Gates and and the creation of the the medicines for malaria venture was a big deal. That was initiated by Gates funding, and now they've grown into a very big successful program with many drugs in the pipeline. How many drugs now? that they're shifting to other indications because their pipeline is full. I mean, 20 years ago, the pipeline was empty and there was five labs working in this. And now it's so competitive, it's, it, there's, it's, it's, there's a lot of people, but not huge. Yeah, but there's room, room for growth. Um, yeah. I, um, it's not necessarily the greatest project for young assistant professors because the money is kind of uh, if you if your drug candidate comes to the end, you know they're going to chop you off. Um, goal is to make a drug, not to keep in your program. So, so, um, so you have to be careful not to jump into a program as an assistant professor that you know when your pharmacokinetics fail, your funding comes to an end. So, the, so that, that's one word of caution, but, uh, you know, if you want to get into real drug discovery, if you want to get into technologies that would enable new approaches to drug discovery, that's more open-ended. But if you have a compound that you're pursuing as a drug, you know, if it has a tox issue or something like that, it, it, it comes to an end very quickly and, and you have to move on to something else. And that's not the best thing for somebody starting a lot, right? So, so you have to be careful about that. Thank you. Good comments. I know we have, we're have we running way out of time, but Charlie, if we have any questions that you might want to read, maybe there's one or two real good nuggets that you want to share with a friend of Mike to maybe address. Yeah, I'll pick a, a, a few. Um, I, I think the panelists have been answering a couple um, uh, in the actual Q&A panel, so thank you for that. Um, one question that I, I did kind of like, it's about the collaborations. You've been successful in large and long-term collaborations. Uh, what advice do you have for efficiently uh, working uh, in this uh, type of environment with multiple groups um, around the world? Any last minute thoughts on that? Well, we, you know, this is, uh, it sounds like a plant because my answer is it's been great working with CDD uh, for data sharing. Uh, we're, um, we, we've, uh, uh, you know, subscribed to CDD for probably 20 years. I don't know if somebody, you guys probably know, but we, we were one of the first groups to uh, take advantage of CDD for our data sharing. And that's, uh, you know, obviously a platform that allows us to share data uh, anywhere with anybody uh, that has has access, and so uh, that's been it's a big problem too because uh, you know there's so many parameters for so many compounds, and you can't. You know, I thought about having some room with lasers or something, or like the police have. You know, you click your fingers and some data come up on the screen or something, and <laughs> you know a three dimensional display of data, so it's always in your presence, but. 
Yeah, CDD is is the way to do it. Um, uh, the the amount of data is huge. Some I can't remember uh, all of the pharmacokinetic parameters on all the compounds and all of the things. I mean, I, I can't remember even the people that work directly on the projects, the students, uh, I'm not sure they remember everything either. So it's, it's nice to have a database where you can immediately, you know, within seconds, do a comparison, you know, across compounds, right? Otherwise, just you're looking up data. Nobody can remember all these numbers. It's, it's, it's enormous, right? And, 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 and yeah, and it, it, it's not logical, right? It's just, you know, why one structure versus the other. And, and it, it, you know, yeah, you need, you need a rapid way to figure out where you are and what you've done. Excellent. I, I promise not a plant. Well, not, not from my end anyways. It it's came from an actual, it turns out it's a big problem. It's, <laughs> actual it's attendee not, coming in. <laughs> not a uh, problem. Yeah. I, I know it's, we're running over time, but I'll do one more um, because I, I do hear questions on natural products uh, throughout all of our webinar series uh, coming through. So um, we had an attendee asking if there's ongoing phenotypic screening of natural products for the anti- parasitics yeah so so i think that the, australia is particularly big on this they have a center that is devoted to natural product screens for neglected diseases i think it's a perfectly good approach i think the, the number one question is whether it's scalable so uh nobody's going to synthesize a complicated natural product if you want to get a drug that's a dollar per pill right that the target product profile so that excludes all these protein antibody drugs and stuff that you see on TV. You know, there's no Optiva for malaria coming soon. Um, so, 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 you know, nobody's going to do a 30 step synthesis of an anti-malarial drug. So, so the, so the natural product, the number one question that the agencies are going to ask is whether it's, it's scalable by fermentation, right? If it can be made super cheaply by fermentation, um, it's a go. Otherwise it's dead. Okay. You have to get down to a dollar, Right, so we can't do taxol, for example, right? It's not going to be a taxol for malaria, right? Cool. So, so, so that's what you have. To, that's the number one question you have to ask is whether you can ferment this organism and make lots of drugs cheaply. All right, everyone. Well, I don't think we're going to do any more questions. Um, I, there were several questions on on you know how to contact. Um, the panelists here. So this is a great screen to end on perhaps, um, you know, things are, they're asking for things like interns or partnerships or collaborations and, or screening activities and who to contact to move forward or when they have ideas about that. So we certainly appreciate you guys uh, providing your email addresses here and for the attendees, uh, take note there because um, uh, that, that is indeed how you would uh, reach out to um, uh, Fred and Mike. Frank? Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. So I would like to thank Fred and Mike for this, uh, for the opportunity to work together to present this webinar uh, of amazing interest. Uh, great stimulating conversation today. And I want to thank the attendees as well for joining us. I am not going to do justice to this slide, but it really talks about what CDD Vault is. Again, a data management system for uh, drug discovery. We have some other tools uh, in, the, in the tool belt now uh, in uh, assay annotation and metadata meta, de, meta management tool as well as BioHarmony, which is a mineable data on known drugs. Very interesting new launch as of April 1st. So it's getting a lot of attention. And I will say, please come. We, uh, in, in, in keeping with what we talked about today, there will be a webinar with this, which is specifically a demo of the CDD vaults uh, for infectious disease drug discovery on June 17th. Please join us. Again, Fred, Mike, thank you so much. It was a pleasure uh, working with you guys today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. All right. Bye, everyone.